Hello, and thanks to everyone for joining our Global Youth Meetup Live Alumni Career Chat. I'm Diana Drake, Managing Editor of the Wharton Global Youth Program. Graduates of the Wharton School become captains of industry, innovative entrepreneurs, nonprofit leaders, and pioneers in finance. Our Jim Career Chat introduces all of you to some of Wharton's successful alumni and provides a forum for students to ask questions about jobs and skills and find out what it's like to study at Wharton. Today, we welcome Artem Marichin, Managing Director and Head of Data Analytics for Cowan Sustainable Investments based in New York City with offices around the world. He has more than a decade of investment, operational, and data science experience across sectors and asset classes, including a significant expertise in technology, energy, and consumer. Prior to joining CSI, Mr. Mary Chin was the founder and CEO of Zodiac, a predictive data analytics company that helped brands improve strategic decision-making and business operations. Zodiac was acquired by Nike, where he led Nike's consumer data science efforts as the company shifted strategic focus toward direct-to-consumer. Throughout his career, Artem has combined statistical and quantitative analysis of granular data with deep fundamental research to understand investment opportunities, financial strategy, and business operations. He graduated summa cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania, completing the Roy Vagelos Program in Life Sciences and Management. As part of the dual degree program, he received a BS in economics from the Wharton School with concentrations in finance, statistics, and operations in information management, and a BA with distinction in biology from the College of Arts and Sciences. Artem, thank you for taking time to speak with us today. Thanks so much for having me, Dan, and it's a pleasure to meet you. So I have a few questions I'd like to ask today's guest to get started, and then I encourage those on the call to drop your questions into the chat. Uh, it's much more fun and much more engaging and interesting uh, when we hear from the students. So please, please don't be shy. Ask all questions. All right. So I'm, I want to start out to find out a little bit about the company itself. Cowan Sustainable Investments provides capital and data analytics solutions to companies at the cutting edge of innovation in environmental sustainability. So these are companies that are leading the way in the world's transition to a more sustainable economy by addressing challenges like pollution. Can you help us to better understand CSI's business model, perhaps an example of one of your investments, um, and really what the relationship looks like once you invest? Do, do you then work together to strengthen the business and also the environment? Yeah, of course, happy to. And um, I guess I'll generally start a little bit broader because I know it's a it's generally a high school audience, and I'm not sure how much context uh, you all have around uh, how kind of investment firms and others work. So. Um, Constantable investments are, first of all, an investment firm. What that means in the broadest sense is that we're raising capital from investors. Um, for us, those tend to be pension plans, sovereign wealth funds, kind of large institutions, um, could be endowments and so forth. And then we're making investments on their behalf. And every investment firm as a business model generally has it in a focus for um, on what they're investing in. So mandate for us, that really is uh, on sustainability. So we're only looking at companies that are advancing the world's transition to a sustainable future. We tend to think of that as currently uh, looking at four different types of opportunities. And so those can be the future of transportation, which is electric vehicles, batteries, those types of technologies, renewable energy, so everything from solar, wind, and, and heavy associated uh, supply chain, agriculture and food technology, so looking at those opportunities. And the fourth category that we look at is uh, industrial efficiency. And when we're making an investment, we're uh, generally looking to deploy 100 or 250, two, 250 million uh, of capital into a company. Uh, as we make an investment, we'll then usually uh, join the board or really help influence the company strategy and that's how they approach uh, kind of the go forward operations. And then we'll also um, use our data science and data analytics capabilities to work closely with the company to understand the data that they have available. And um, we'll basically uh, help them use that to grow faster or to improve their profitability. Um, as an example of a couple of investments that we've made, uh, one is in a company called Proterra, which is the world's largest manufacturer of electric buses. So you can think of them as being similar to Tesla, except um, basically making the buses that municipalities have, so for public transportation, we're also making a lot of other heavy duty vehicles. 
And um, that's a you know, pretty clear sustainable uh, company because as you can imagine, um, those large buses are not very fuel efficient traditionally. And so being able to move them to an electric uh, vehicle reduces a lot of fuel consumption. And also because the routes are pretty standardized, it's something where you can optimize that system pretty, pretty easily. As a second investment, which is a little bit different, it's a company called EcoATM, but it's the world's uh, largest um, effectively recycler of used cell phones. So it's taking a lot of cell phones that people might have to store at home. And instead of them being stored at home or thrown out, it'll give them a second life by oftentimes selling those to developing markets and, and other um, kind of uh, perhaps lower socioeconomic groups. And that's uh, really part of the industry of circular economy, uh, sorry, uh, circular uh, commerce, which really allows uh, kind of the reuse of products versus them going to waste. So as someone who's immersed in this market, how are we doing? <laughs> how are we doing with things like technologies around renewable energy? Are they becoming more of a standard in the market? So, so renewable energy is, um, I think it's, it's, it's a pretty fascinating time and things are changing quickly, but I'd say a lot more needs to be get, get done. I, just focusing on renewable energy, um, it's, it's one that's perhaps the most interesting. So over the past 10 years, the cost of a lot of renewable technologies, so solar and wind has come down dramatically, um, oftentimes on the order of 80 to 90%. And the change that that's actually made is that um, really 10 or 15 years ago, if you were a country or a company looking to build a new electric power plant, um, let, let's say you were in, uh, in Africa or in China or the Middle East, you would usually choose a fossil fuel-based technology. Coal or natural gas or oil would be cheaper to build. Um, and that oftentimes wouldn't make sense. Conceptually, you'd think that doesn't make sense because there, those areas might be so sunny. Um, but the cost of uh, those renewable technologies was just so expensive. Over the past 10 years, with the reduction in cost, if you're in those same countries today, you will choose to build a solar power plant because it ends up being that cheaper. And obviously, there's a lot of other environmental benefits. And so really, for the first 10 times over the past kind of decade in, in renewables, we've eliminated what's known as the green premium, which is the cost that the additional cost that you usually have to make to use something that's kind of sustainable or good for the environment versus the alternative. And the impact that that's had for um, kind of renewable energy is that every year there's been a tremendous growth in the amount of solar and wind deployments that are happening. It's still a small fraction of the total uh, kind of electrical generation globally, but we're definitely seeing progress there. Um, in other areas, not as much has been done. So when we think about construction and, and cement, that's still a huge pollution and the, the cost of green cement, kind of what's known as green cement is just really far away. So we require a lot more investment there. Uh, but we're definitely starting to see progress and that's what makes us so fascinating is that year by year, there's just so much uh, innovation and change that's happening. Absolutely. In my intro, I said that over your career, you have combined statistical and quantitative analysis with deep fundamental research to understand investment opportunities. That is a mouthful. <laughs> so I want you to tell us more of exactly what that means. Um, what is your area of expertise? And can you also describe for us predictive analytics? Yeah, so um, it's a number, number of questions there, but I, I guess I'll first start kind of what, what I mean on the investment side. So generally when people kind of describe investing, there might be classically two large I feel. So one is kind of fundamental investing and that maybe Warren Buffett's the best example of fundamental investor. So that's someone that's really focused on understanding a company and industry, the management team, how do they operate, but what makes a business good or strong and how do you invest based off of that? And so you're really you know, trying to understand those types of company specific fa factors, but um, really not as much focused on you know, other information like data. The other types of investors are oftentimes quantitative investors where they might not care at all what they're investing and they have no idea what the company is or what the company does, but they're just trying to look at large amounts of data and understand patterns of it. As kind of one example, um, let's say you're looking at weather data and it's going to be really, really hot in, a, in New York, for example. Well, a lot of people are going to need to use the air conditioner. That's going to require more electricity that's going to require more natural gas to be used to generate electricity. So you might have a quantitative investor who sees that weather is going to be hot, purchase natural gas to make money. But they identify that pattern purely through data. And historically, those kind of two styles of investing were very, very different. Um, my background and what I really studied at Warren was very much a fundamental oriented framework of investing. So along the lines of Warren Buffett, where I'm 
and looking to understand companies and industries and what makes them strong. But uh, from my kind of LSM background and experience, I also had a lot of um, computation and biology and other data science courses. And so it was always kind of fascinating to me is that companies increasingly have more data available. So if you're Macy's or Nike or really almost any other company, McDonald's or anyone else, you have a tremendous amount of information on your customers. So who's coming in, what are they purchasing? And investors historically had never really used that information to make decisions. And so the what I had really been thinking over the past kind of 10, 15 years is how do you increasingly start using that type of information to better understand businesses, but use that information in a granular data. Uh, so the millions and millions of customers that might uh, transact with these companies, but how do you draw insights from that type of information to then help you make better investment decisions? Um, so that that was kind of the, the focus there. And uh, Dan, I'm sorry, what were the other kind of parts of your question? <laughs> you answered them all. I, I think the last one I asked was just, I, I like to kind of unpack some of the jargon and predictive analytics was, um, I asked you to unwrap that one a little bit. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so generally when, when you're just describing statistics, there's different forms of, of statistics that can be done. Um, historically, there was a lot that was in industry just called business intelligence, but that's effectively how do you look at data and understand what's happening. So that might be looking at how many, uh, how many hamburgers that we saw last week, if you're McDonald's, for example. Um, and that's looking at historical data. Predictive anal analytics is instead of just looking at what's happened in the past, how do you use that information, other um, basically data that you have to make predictions about the future? So how many burgers am I going to sell next week or next month? And um, if you're a company, uh, that's really what matters much more um, because that's what you have to plan your staffing levels. That's how you have to think about supply chain. It's like how many beef patties do I need to purchase? It doesn't really matter what I sold last week. It's how many am I going to sell next week? And so um, predictive analytics broadly is a subset of statistics that's really become increasingly important over the past, say, 20, 20 years, but especially over the past 10 with the increased amount of machine learning and AI and other types of data that's become available. Hmm. Yeah, so the, you've done so many interesting things in your career, and you mentioned working at Nike, or at least you've had experience with Nike. You, you led Nike's consumer data science efforts. Um, can you describe this experience for us and what it was like to be part of data-driven decision-making at a multinational corporation, such a well-known brand? Yeah, so the, and, and my time at Nike is definitely one of the highlights of my career. Uh, it's it's pretty fascinating because as a brand, Nike's been around for really over 40 years. And uh, for most of that history, they had a wholesale business model. And what that would mean is that Nike focused as a brand on designing the shoes, on produ producing them, um, and then really a lot of marketing. But they didn't do the actual selling. What they would do is they would sell those shoes to retailers like Foot Locker or, or Macy's or Kohl's or others. And it would be those retailers that would actually fundamentally sell the shoes and have a relationship with the customer. And over the past really 10 or 15 years, probably one trend that's become increasingly common in, um, for, uh, for brands is to go direct to consumer. So to increasingly sell directly and to develop that relationship. And it's really been driven by a lot of new technologies that have become available, e-commerce, um, kind of a lot of fulfillment uh, and those aspects. And Nike, um, had obviously seen these trends and increasingly thought, well, because of the strength of our brand and because how much people love Nike, um, we, we should have that relationship with that consumer uh, directly because we can then offer them a better experience. We can tell them more brand stories. We can uh, really foster that relationship. And so they've increasingly been making that maneuver to move from wholesale to direct to consumer. Now, when you're a really large multinational corporation that's been doing something for 40 years in a particular way, that actually takes a lot of work to try to make that transition. And so my time there was really fascinating because from the start, what Nike said was, yes, we want to make this transition, but unlike other companies that you know, maybe had been doing retail for 30 years in a certain way, we know that there is, let's say, a better way to do direct to consumer. We want that to be driven by data, by personalization, by really making the right experience for each consumer. And so from, from the start, there was a really, really heavy emphasis and investment on what are the tools that are available to make that better experience? And so in my role uh, leading the consumer data science team, uh, my team was really responsible for making a lot of those models and software uh, technologies on the back end are powering the Nike website, the Nike app, the sneakers app, and so on. 
And so um, as a couple of examples, if you go into any of those experiences, the shoes that are actually shown to you are personalized based off your previous purchases, um, whether it's the colors that you liked or the styles, and that's different for every sing single individual. As my team that put together a lot of those models. As another example, if you ever shop with Nike, you're, you're a Nike member or part of Nike Plus, which is our kind of membership and loyalty program. And it is really our models on the back end that are making predictions about each of those customers. So are you going to come back? What types of things do you care about? If we want, do you like running? Do you like basketball? And what does that mean for the types of offers that we show, the types of emails that we send to you and so on? And so there's just a tremendous amount that's happening kind of behind the scenes there that's, that's powering it. So um, really kind of exciting times. And then I'll also just kind of mention when COVID happened um, and kind of most of the retail world shut, it was a pretty fascinating transition to see because we had so many consumers that you know, kind of were used to buying Nikes at Foot Locker and others that immediately came and started buying it direct. So it was just kind of fascinating to see that transition as well. Hmm, wow. Yeah. And so you, you also started your own business before that Zodiac, correct? Um, which you sold to Nike. And I'm wondering how your entrepreneurial mindset served you in both large and small companies. So, you know, you, you definitely were an entrepreneur. You had that energy. You started something from scratch. Um, and then how did some of those skills carry forward? Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's, it's a good question. I think, um, so, so Zodiac, which I'll mention, uh, I, I did found, but I, I was actually co-founded with a professor from Warren, Peter Fader, who's a marketing professor. Oh, okay. um, so uh, another kind of connection to, to Warren uh, there. But um, I tend to, like, my, my experience tends to be entrepreneurial, not just in Zodiac, but in other firms that I've worked with, they've generally been smaller teams. And e even when I worked at kind of Goldman or at Count, although the firms themselves might have thousands of employees, the specific teams I work with are pretty small. And what happens in smaller teams is you generally have a lot of autonomy and the ability to say, if something doesn't make sense, how do I try to improve it? And I've, I've seen oftentimes in larger organizations, um, especially if you're early on in your career, some certain cultures don't actually um, kind of incentivize that, where oftentimes people uh, view it where they just kind of come in and they have a specific role or process they're following, and they're not taking the opportunity to take a step back and say, hey, how can I actually improve this process? And I, I think the biggest difference for someone that's entrepreneurial or used to small teams is that you tend to get frustrated if things just don't make sense. You want things to kind of be better. And so I, I think that's really what's helped me a lot, whether it was at Nike or at Count or at Zodiac, but the idea that if something didn't make sense, you want to create a better way to do it. And I think that's true for really all entrepreneurs or anyone who wants to kind of improve the world. And really the same thing about sustainability and why I'm so passionate about uh, the investing that we're doing now. Yeah. Um, so I want to remind everyone, I have a couple more questions for our guests, but please, please put your questions um, in the chat and we'll get to them in a few minutes. So I'd be re remiss if I didn't mention the Wharton Global Youth Program's um, annual investment competition. In recent years, competitors have been taken with ESG investing. And I was hoping you could talk for a moment about the broader picture of ESG or environmental, social, and corporate governance factors. ESG really touches on everything from how companies are meeting the challenges of climate change to how they're treating their employees and how decisions are being made at the board of directors level. As a leader in a sustainable investment company, what would you like students to understand about this ESG movement and the growth of ESG investing? And also, I'd be curious about kind of your influence as an investor as well on companies that are, are um, focused on ESG. Yeah, all, all, all great and important questions. I, I think in the broadest sense, the, the way I think about it is that prior to ESG becoming, well, maybe, maybe a different way to say this, it, it comes down to the differences between shareholders and stakeholders and the evolving view of those concepts. And historically, corporations, um, and this is just really a, sub, uh, I guess a side effect of capitalism, really cared about shareholders, which are those individuals that specifically own shares in the firm, i.e. the owners. And there's kind of this notion that everything a corporation should be doing is about maximizing value for the shareholders at the expense of all else. And that's kind of an extreme view of capitalism, how corporations should work, but it's one that's been kind of 
really, really common. Stakeholders, on the other hand, is a bit of a broader definition. It does include shareholders, but also includes employees. It might include the government, the environment, but really anyone that's affected by a corporation's actions. And oftentimes in the past, when corporations were operating, they were ignoring all stakeholders except shareholders. ESG and the focus on our ESG is really a way to kind of level that playing field by making sure that corporations through the actions of shareholders are considering other stakeholders as well. So the environment, the social uh, corporate governance, those other factors. And so I think it's absolutely a net good because um, oftentimes when you don't have that focus, it might make sense for an individual company to make a decision that in a micro way is beneficial for it. So for example, using a fossil fuel versus renewable, but if every company is making that same decision, it's a net negative for the world. And so the uh, kind of ESG movement and all these factors is really making the case that the corporations shouldn't just be looking purely at shareholders and you should be considering other stakeholders that you have an impact on. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's certainly something that's say, well overdue and is, and is having a lot, a lot of focus. Um, from, from our perspective, obviously, as, a, as an investor, we're particularly focused on the E in ESG. And although we care about certainly the social and the governance, um, for us, it's very clear that any company that we're investing in has a very clear environmental be uh, benefit and impact. And so when we make an investment, we, as part of our process, quantify what's the actual reduction in either greenhouse gases or in fuel usage or in plastics or in pollution that through the company's actions uh, is kind of the improvement on the environment. And so that's kind of one very explicit way that we look at that. And then we help the company actually track that and report on it and, and, and so on. Okay. I, I bet our our, our uh, listeners will also have a few more questions related to that because I know we have some of our past investment competitors joining us today. Uh, so I want to pivot for a minute and talk about Wharton. You completed the Penn Life Sciences and Management Program. This prestigious program aims to foster creativity, entrepreneurialism, insight, and principled decision making. Can you talk about your experience in the program and really how it prepared you for your career? Yes, I, I only have the best things to say about the Life Sciences Management Program, but also about the other kind of Warren and Penn um, dual degree and interdisciplinary programs. The, to me, what stands out the most is that oftentimes if you're in college and you're studying a subject or a major, you're learning kind of one type of problem solving approach or critical thinking, and, and you're approaching problems from that vantage point very often. The benefit of having an interdisciplinary program is you learn a few different ways to look at problems, which really serves you well because you know, not, not everything needs the same approach. You want to have a variety of different mental models. Um, in life science and management, as, as uh, Dan, as you mentioned, I had kind of the finance and the business experience for more, and then I studied biology. And um, you know, in the, in the broader sense, the way that I've always thought about that was that um, kind of the Warren kind of thinking is oftentimes very top down, where you're thinking about the macro economy, an industry, a company, and then you're diving very deep, whereas science fundamentally is very bottom up. You have a hypothesis, you're running an experiment, looking at data, and then you're trying to generalize out from there. And it's really rare, uh, in, in my experience, to have kind of learned both top down and bottom up thinking, but it's so important whether you're, you're an investor or maybe a consultant or just kind of an operator. In a, in, in a company to be able to kind of look at things from multiple different vantage points and, and take those experiences. Um, and then for, for LSM specifically, I'd say one thing that I really appreciated about the program was that they gave you the opportunity to have both a science uh, internship and a business internship so to see how the differences in those environments are. And so one summer at school, I, I spent in a bioinformatics group at Merck looking at data on genetic expression to try to understand the, um, the pattern, uh, the implications that they had for protein uh, expression and as a result, potentially uh, different disease states. And then the other summer I was uh, at Goldman Sachs in one of their investment groups. Very different experiences, but wow. both yeah. super, super interesting. That's so fascinating. I wanna to turn to a couple of the student questions. So Loxana has the first one and it's a little long, but um, I'll read it anyway. Even if humans can substitute fossil fuel vehicles with electric vehicles and or install solar panels and wind turbines to replace coal and natural gas power plants, we'll still have to mine for resources such as nickel, cobalt, copper, and so on, which expends large amounts of greenhouse gases. To offset the greenhouse gases generated from mining activities, 
is it possible to use carbon capture technology? If so, is there a market for carbon capture technology? And what would such a market look like? So amazing question. Yes. Uh, and, and, and definitely not starting off with the easy ones. Uh, I, so the, the, there's, there's a couple of pieces. So, so one, you're absolutely right that yes, as we, as we move towards um, various or renewable fuels or electric vehicles, there, there's still a need for mining and others. Um, some of this becomes a little bit circular, which is a lot of those heavy duty machines can over time also move away from using fossil fuels to using electric vehicles and batteries. So part of the reduction in what makes those processes inherently uh, dirty uh, can be improved over time. And it's, it, it's the same thing for a lot of other industrial uh, production uses that Yes, they might require fossil fuels for electricity, but as you kind of increasing the electric uh, generation from renewables, that lowers the overall cost of those. Um, that doesn't get away from, from your broader point here, which is that they still will release greenhouse gas regardless. And yes, as a result, um, increasingly there is a view that we will need true kind of carbon, uh, carbon sequestration, carbon capture over time. Um, right now, we are pretty far away from those technologies. Generally, um, Economists think about what is the cost of a, is a metric ton of CO2 uh, to be released into the atmosphere, and they, although we don't currently have a, a carbon price in most places in the world for that, um, economists kind of peg that number to be usually around 100 to 150 dollars a ton. Um, most carbon capture technologies today, um, other than kind of planting forests, cost on the order of 400 to 1,000 dollars a ton. So they are not really economic because it still costs so much to be able to actually uh, capture a, a ton of carbon out of the air. Um, that sounds bad until you realize, that kind of going back to my earlier comments, that over the past 10 years, the cost of renewables have come down by 90 plus percent in a lot of areas. And so what we're really saying is that it's a nascent industry. We need a lot more investment. We need a number of promising entrepreneurs to be focused on this issue. Um, we need dollars to kind of go and technologies to be invented here. And then over time, we do have to believe that there are opportunities to kind of improve that. Um, in terms of the market itself, I guess the last part of your question, uh, a really good question. Um, right now, there's there have been, I guess, over the past 10, 10 years, discussions around things like cap and trade and other um, kind of credits that you can do for carbon. A lot of companies today are doing um, voluntary carbon credits. So um, as part of ESG, they are saying, Look, I'm actually going to purchase carbon credits from from forests, uh, from planting forests, or from others, just to reduce my overall carbon impact on the world. So a lot of companies are doing this on a voluntary basis. But it's quite possible that um, it, it will require just some overall governmental regulation. Mm, absolutely. Luke wants to know which models you use with your team in predictive analytics. Uh, so it, it's a variety of models, Luke. There's no it definitely kind of depending on the problem, but it can be anything from what I describe as like simple linear regression to deep learning and machine learning models. Um, it, it really kind of just depends on the type of problem you're, you're trying to predict. And so sometimes you're looking at um, basically categorizing something. So saying, is it um, yeah, a blue object or a red object as an example? And so those models are different from those that are trying to predict a specific kind of continuous number. Um, but, but it can be a variety. Uh, generally, the, the approach that you want to take is start with the simplest thing, which tends to be some type of linear logistic regression. And then if you have more and more data or it's more complex, you can explore more kind of machine learning AI type models. Frank would like to know how you determine the weightings of different investments in the firm's portfolio and decide which companies to invest more in. It's a great risk management question, Frank. Um, so it, each kind of an investment firm or fund thinks about it a little bit differently, and it's both a function of the mandate and what, and what investors look, look to have from you. Um, so for us, the way that we structure our funds, we, we want to be fairly concentrated. So um, our current fund's uh, around $1.2 billion, and uh, we, we also have a few other additional vehicles. But for that $1.2 billion, we've effectively uh, said that we want to make around 10 investments. 
And so that tends to be pretty concentrated. Some, some funds um, you know, might make 10, sometimes they make 30, but we've kind of made the decision to be fairly concentrated. Across those 10, we uh, obviously each one is focused on sustainability, but we want those to be across a variety of different um, kind of investment themes. So I mentioned electric vehicles, renewables, industrial efficiency, and kind of food and ag tech. So we want those tend to be kind of around those. And we also want them to be generally a mix of enterprise focused or consumer focused. And so Proterra, they sell to governments and municipalities, Eco ATM deals with individual consumers. Um, and so those are generally how we think high level about how making different um, kind of investments and weightings. Um, in terms of making kind of further in, uh, investments, we, we do have the flexibility once to make an initial investment to give them additional capital over time. Um, and we make that decision based on um, really what are the opportunities ahead for that company. Uh, so for Eco ATM, initially our investment was um, 150 million and then we invested in another additional 100 million um, because they were seeing tremendous growth and a lot of opportunity to kind of further continue expanding. Um, I'll, I'll just mention, Frank, for, for us, that's different than uh, because we're, we're a growth equity or private equity firm, that's going to be different than how a lot of uh, public markets or hedge funds think about it, where they might have a more diversified portfolio, 30 to 100 names um, that they're invested in. And there they're thinking much more around, do we have too much exposure to a particular sector or geography or other things? And how do I think about that risk? Uh, but in public uh, markets or in hedge funds, because you can obviously buy and sell every day, you can kind of think about risk in a very dynamic way. Whereas for us, it tends to be um, large illiquid positions that we're holding for five to 10 years. And so our approach tends to be much more uh, initially when we're making the investment in terms of the risk that we're underwriting and willing to take versus the, those that we're not. All right, let's uh, switch over to Wharton for a minute. You mentioned that you, Sebastian would like to know that you mentioned you co-founded Zodiac with a Wharton professor, um, Peter Fader. How do you feel that the connections and relationships you built at Wharton played a role in your professional career? Yeah, uh, I mean, I in the broader sense, I would, I would say that um, pretty much every step along my career journey was either directly or indirectly benefited by Wharton and the, the relationships that I built. Um, just as a couple of examples, the, the Goldman internship that I had for my junior year um, I was introduced to that uh, to that group by a uh, by a Warren professor, um, Professor Ramaswamy. He's a financial a financial prof finance professor focused on derivatives. I was his teaching assistant that semester, and he actually got an outreach from a uh, a Warren MBA graduate who was in that group, asking, "Are there anybody? Is there anybody in your class that you would kind of recommend?" So not only could have our relationship with the professor, but it was a Warren grad from a couple of years back that reached out to him asking for potential recommendations. Um, that same Warren grad is actually someone that I work with currently right now at Cowan. Um, and so, you know, we, we had that relationship for really 15 years. Um, I would also generally say that there, uh, obviously uh, started the company with, uh, with Peter Fader, so another Warren professor, so I've maintained those relationships. But uh, I would say many of my closest friends, um, you know, are, our, our uh, kind of former Warren students are alumni at this point. Uh, and generally, whether you're in finance, you're consulting, or an industry, it's rare to not see a Warren graduate. And so the, the network is really strong. Everyone does kind of tend to be very helpful to each other. And it's uh, definitely a community that you were made a part of uh, after your time graduating. And we did, we actually interviewed Busal a few years ago in the gym. Oh. So <laughs> we got our first introduction to Cowan at that point. Um, so Kavita would like to know something specifically about ESG. Do you view ESG investing as separate from traditional investing, which focuses on profitability, or do ESG factors also play a role in profitability? In other words, can ESG help us identify profitable companies, or is it only helpful to invest sustainably? So. Stump the guest. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just review this question again for a second and see how I want to answer it. Um, so, so ESG focus, the, the ESG factors definitely play a, play a role in profitability. And they, they sometimes come in um, way, ways that you wouldn't you know, necessarily immediately uh, think about, but as a really, really nice one, when we talk about social factors and talk about 
um, DEI, so uh, kind of diversity and inclusion initiatives, which is the idea that um, employees should be kind of well represented and they shouldn't really just be focused on um, kind of one um, socioeconomic or, um, or uh, class fundamentally. Um, all studies show that if you have a diverse employee pool, your company performs better, that it is beneficial to have a variety of opinions. And so in that, in that example, if, uh, as part of ESG, you're focusing on identifying companies that do really have strong uh, diversity inclusion initiatives, um, that is very likely going to be beneficial in helping you make um, strong investments. Um, other examples, if, you know, on an environmental uh, kind of goes to say, but if you're really relying on fossil fuel or taking kind of environmental risks, you're obviously introducing things like potential uh, kind of climate disasters. So if you're talking about a mining company um, or if you're talking about kind of an oil and gas company, you're obviously you know, have kind of run into the potential issues there um, or around a, a pipeline rupture or kind of a ship capsizing or anything of that nature. And so generally there are, there are absolutely areas where focusing on ASG helps improve profitability. Um, I would say that ESG investing is different than you know, 10, 15 years ago, there was kind of more of a social impact investing trend. And oftentimes that type of investing didn't really look at um, kind of profitable investing or, or necessarily generating uh, investment returns. I would say ESG investing is different than that in that the majority of participants very much do care about the financial return um, that, that's being generated. We certainly do. It's just our point of view that given what's happening in the world, you, have, you can actually generate higher returns by focusing on companies that are making an environmental impact than you can on others. Um, and so it really, it really depends on kind of what you're looking at there. Okay. Um, so I would also like you to talk a little bit about your greatest challenge in your career. I always think we learn a lot from that. Maybe a time when you had to pivot or change direction um, or learn from a mistake. Yeah. So, like, I guess the one long answer, and maybe a, a specific piece of in that. Um, so, I think, in, in the broader sense, the, the biggest career challenge that I've had, or the most kind of challenging experience, was was my broader experience of Zodiac, and so starting and building kind of like my own company. And usually, people tell you that you know, entrepreneurism is, is hard, and the hardest thing is to be a founder, and they're absolutely right. Um, and it's just kind of a for the sheer challenge of trying to create a company from, from scratch. But the challenge that that creates is how do you create a vision that actually um, is so compelling that others are willing to believe in it and to buy into it. And that's so critical because you need to go and convince other um, kind of individuals to perhaps leave their job and join what you're working on. And, um, you know, that's, that, that requires kind of so much desire and belief from a founder to create kind of that compelling vision and strategy and an explanation why someone should entrust uh, kind of leaving a potentially larger lucrative firm to join a startup that maybe has like one or two people. Um, and the same thing about how do you then go and build a product that you then have to sell to other companies or consumers that those that care about it when you know, there might be other competing products from large well-established firms. And so in the broadest sense, that was the biggest challenge. I think the most um, kind of particular challenge that we had there is um, when we were looking to uh, raise, so we were a venture back company and we, we raised capital from a number of uh, well, venture capital firms. Um, and the way that that typically works is you raise capital for about a two year period. And so investors don't give you money forever. They say, look, here's money for two years, operate, here's kind of the milestones that we expect. And then what's going, and then assume you're doing well, um, we're going to continue funding you or we'll continue raising. And in that environment, that introduces a lot of risk because two years from now, the economy might be in a recession or something might happen and the fundraising environment might be very different. And it happened for us that when we raised our uh, kind of first round of capital was in uh, late 2015. And then when in late 2017, we were coming out for our next round, although it doesn't, it doesn't strike anyone as a particularly bad recession time for software businesses, that actually was a pretty difficult time in the market. And there was a very clear challenge where the amount of cash that we had available was on the order of a few months and at some point even less than that. 
And um, I had a team of about 15 or 20 people that fundamentally were depending on me finding funding for the company to make sure that they continued having their own job uh, and being able to continue to build the product and execute on our vision. And in terms of like the highest stress environments, the idea of you being responsible for fundamentally the well-being of like, like a larger growing team is, is, is pretty, uh, pretty profound, especially in those environments. Um, and uh, there, there's nothing that kind of, uh, kind of keeps you up at night more than that. Um, obviously, the experience turned out really well because we, we were, in fact, able to uh, raise capital. And that was a, a testament to the product that we built. Investors really uh, also were able to buy into the vision um, around the, the product that we're building. And of course, having Peter Fader as a co-founder was incredibly helpful there. And then um, ultimately, of course, we were able to sell the company to Nike for kind of the, the same reason. And so um, it did require a lot of work. It was a it was kind of a hard, a hard challenging moment, but uh, one that certainly worked out well for everyone. Absolutely. Um, so I guess this is an advice question, but we always have to have one of those in here. What, you know, what would you tell your 17 year old self that you wish you knew then that you know now? Yeah, I would. Um, so as a 17 year old, I was extremely focused on really kind of academics and grades. And I would say that was the approach that I had from college and you know, I definitely took a lot of classes and focused on a lot of things. And I would say, you know, the college experience or what, what kind of today looking back, it was absolutely my classes and everything that helped and established kind of the grounding for my career. But the thing that has been most helpful have been the relationships that I fostered. And um, certainly, you know, at Penn, I was involved in LSM. I was in a business fraternity. I was in a social fraternity. So I did have a lot of those activities but I didn't focus purely as much on fostering a lot of the relationships with other students. And that's something that I wish I had done more of um, because it's incredibly common now for, and a Warren class is really only around five, 600 students, as a, if I recall correctly. So it's not that large, um, but I really maybe was only close to 100, 150 of them. Um, but now as I'm 10 years, 10 years out, it's, it's remarkable how often I run into someone that was in my Warren class um, that just didn't know that well. And it's great because we certainly have something kind of to talk about and start building that relationship, but it would have been a lot easier if I could have reached out to them because I had already known them. Um, and so maybe the key piece of advice I would give there is just make sure that you're you know, fostering and building those relationships um, because that's really, it's gonna be so critical to you both in your career and just interpersonally going forward. Yes, absolutely. So Josh wants to know, we have a technical, a little bit of a technical question. Being that you and your team are on the buy side, how closely do you work with Cowan's self sell side analysts? And does your sustainability research ever get incorporated into the Cowan's sell side research reports? Yeah, so, so Josh, generally the answer is um, no, not really. Um, so the, so the, the way that it works because we're on the buy side and because Cowan both has a Kind of sell side equity research and investment bank is that there is a Chinese wall between the, the, the two practices. So generally, we're not aware of what the other side is working on, um, certainly on the investment banking side, because that would give us material non public information and we don't want that. And obviously, Cowan doesn't want that. So there's kind of very clear barriers where we don't really talk to that side all that regularly. On the sell side research piece, we certainly have access to those reports and we can call those analysts that we have spoken of them in the past just to get their kind of industry perspective. We're generally not asking them about specific companies or sharing what we're working on for kind of that same reason. Um, and so that, that's kind of on that piece. So we're, we, we speak with them occasionally, but not too closely. And then to the second part of the question, um, our sustainability research is, is all proprietary. And so that's not shared or, or put into their uh, reports at all. Great. All right. Well, I think that we've we've answered a lot of different questions about your career and and also about ESG and all the very different ways that um, you operate. Do you have anything else you'd like to share with uh, high school students out there, particularly I think young investors? Um, you know, you mentioned this piece about relationships, and that is often a common theme in our career chat because I think it's something that you don't really think about when you're 17. Is this the power of relationships moving forward and how, how that's going to influence your career. But I also think people are also very important to the investing world and to understand kind of the power of people within that realm. So, you know, what might you tell to a young investor who's just starting out learning about investing of all kinds? Um, 
I mean, I, I, I'll give a comment just specifically on investing and then maybe a little bit more broader just piece of advice. So on investing, I'd say the answer is try to learn as much as you can. Um, and that generally it's always beneficial to look at uh, kind of not, not just other kind of successful investors in their style, but look at a variety of companies, industries. Um, there tends to be a focus oftentimes that uh, people tend to specialize very early in their career. So they'll just look at consumer companies or just look at internet software names. Um, I think it's very beneficial to try to be a generalist and to see more things. Um, and it's the same idea of how do you create mental models across a variety of different situations. Um, and so good investors are those that have fundamentally over time developed mental models and the ability to recognize patterns that when they look at a company or industry, they instantly think, hey, here's a few other situations or times that I've seen things. And that can be in the same industry, it can be in the same macroeconomic environment, could be across others, but generally be kind of a student of history and, and other information as an investor um, and, and be a sponge. So that's kind of the investing specific one. The other more general one, which is also applicable to investing, but I think to, to all pieces um, is that, and, and, and something that I didn't appreciate kind of going from high school and the beginning of my career is that in high school and even in college, your ability to control your environment and be successful in the environment that you're in is really high. If you study, you can get good grades fundamentally, right? Or you can really focus your attention. As you graduate and you, as you move into the real world, your control over the overall environment and success is generally lower. And investing, you can think of that as you can make a great investment and then out of nowhere, a geopolitical conflict emerges or suddenly a recession hits that you, you know, may or may not have been able to predict. And so oftentimes your kind of success isn't directly uh, you know, related to your output or what you're putting in. And that's oftentimes a challenge to kind of get used to that feeling that your control over your environment's a little bit less. And the, uh, the hallmarks of a good investor is someone that can not only understand that, but also understands that it's really about having the right process and the approach and that there might be kind of cycles or volatility around whatever you're working on. But if you're really kind of focused and continue to you know, work hard to learn more to stay process oriented that that is really what makes a good investor over time because you're judged over a pattern time frame of kind of years decades and so on not over like what happens next month um, and it's the same thing in a career that sometimes things are outside of your control maybe you joined a job and the manager you really liked left um, and as a result the job is no longer kind of what you expected totally outside of your control and that's not um, you just need to understand that that happens in life and then you can kind of have the ability to um, you know, make more decisions going forward. Great, Artem, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and time with us today. We really appreciate it. And thank you to all our guests for joining us on Career Chat. Stay tuned for information on the next one, which we will announce soon. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks so, thanks so much for having me, Dan, and uh, thanks everyone for joining and for the great questions.